From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio. Hello, welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. My name is Noel. They call me Ben. We're joined, as always, with our super producer, Paul Mission Control Deccant. Most importantly, you are you. You are here. That makes this the stuff they don't want you to know. And, fellow conspiracy realists, you may be part of tonight's program. That's right. It's time for Listener Mail. We are going to uh, get some updates from our fellow conspiracy realists about uh, drugs, uh, about uh, HVAC, and uh, (laughs) we want to give a shout out to Brock for hipping us to the return of the humble farmer. Uh, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, so thank you for keeping us, uh, keeping a finger on the pulse of that one. We're going to talk about a very disturbing story out of Australia. And then we're going to, you know, uh, we got some, we got some stuff we have to get off our collective chest about clones. But before we do any of that, uh, we have been like so many other people tracing this strange story about Kate Middleton. The royal drama. Yes, we've become a couple of uh, trio of royal watchers, haven't we, Ben? Mm. Not really. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's interesting, though. There, you know, I'm with you, Matt. When we talked about it on Strange News a couple of weeks ago, uh, who cares? <laughs> Like, there is some who cares to it. Like, okay, so, you know, the, the, the Prince of Wales is, has a mistress. So, oh, surprise, surprise. You I know? just, I, I do have to say one thing, though, Noel, yeah. as we're getting in. Um, I want to make a point that I didn't make when we're talking about this previously. Uh, obviously, I am not a monarchist. I'm, I'm the oh, opposite end neither. of that spectrum. I don't but, think any of us. Yeah, are, I don't yeah. think we are. But I do have to say something I didn't bring up earlier. One important thing for us to remember is that people in the monarchy or in the aristocracy are humans like anybody else, and they did not choose to be in their position. You know what I mean? Yeah. They were born into it. That's true. The ones that married into it chose it a little bit. That's uh, you true. Could argue. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. true. Um, Guys, well, yeah, uh, yeah, go ahead. Before you really jump into yeah, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't, I don't think anybody caught the joke, and I don't think I explained myself when we were talking about this last time. I said my favorite royal watcher, the only person I pay attention to, is Byron Deniston. I don't, I don't think I caught that either. It's yeah, a character it from Comedy Bang Bang, and I was trying to be silly because it's uh, a really great character. Uh, mm. That includes oh, sure. like Lady Amelia Spencer and the Grizz, of course. Cause... That's a deep cut, bro. I listen to that show plenty <laughs> and I've seen most of the series, but not aware of that one. Okay. All right. No, my bad. <laughs> it's okay, though, man. You explained it now. Uh, I'm going to seek those episodes out. But, um, you know, we, we talked about this on Strange News a few weeks ago. And then Ben and I, Matt, was uh, had some family obligations. But Ben and I went to New York and were lucky enough to be on the podcast Sauce on the Side uh, with our pal Gandhi from the Elvis Duran Morning Show. Um, and her uh, producer, Diamond, had some real... Uh, takes you know on this stuff and, and was was all over it and it gave me the, the a moment to kind of realize that maybe i had i don't know been a little easy on the royal family perhaps in in the segment where i was sort of like there's nothing going on at all everything's above board she's just having a surgery and photoshopping her own family photos yeah it's weird that that she would do that a b that this statement would come out signed C, which apparently is the way she signs her name, by the way. But at the time I didn't realize that. And it seemed a little odd, um, kind of doubt that many of the Royals are doing their own Twitters or their own X's. But then again, you know, there is a certain expectation that what you see uh, on those kind of platforms, it, there's certainly a possibility that it is coming directly from the source. We certainly know that's the case with, uh, you know, uh, Donald Trump, for example, and, and others um, that, uh, clearly are tweeting themselves because the, you, you couldn't pay people to, to write stuff this, this bad and, and self-incriminating. Um, but my main thing was, yeah, it's a little weird that she's been out of the public eye for so long. And it was a little weird that they posted this picture because of course it was going to be taken as sort of a, a proof of life kind of situation. And the fact that it was so weirdly and awkwardly doctored really 
called into question the whole thing. And I will stand by my whole thing about all of this, which is that the PR firm or whatever, it's handling the royal family's public affairs, um, not doing a great job. Because, you know, guys, we say it all the time. If there's a question and you just introduce more questions or introduce more vagueness, you're going you're gonna to have a conspiracy feeding frenzy on your hands, right? And that's what we've got here. Especially with the royal family, right? right? Which is a main character in so many conspiracies. And then this also, this kind of speculation is uh, exacerbated in the age of social media, right? Because now people are able to share any kind of theory, uh, whether or not it's based on fact or some kind of research. And then other people will go with it because it's the more interesting story. I remain, uh, <laughs> I still, uh, I still crack up about the, uh, the folks who were convinced for a while that Kate Middleton was out of the public eye because she got a Brazilian butt lift, which we mentioned previously, but I just thought that was so silly. Um, I tuned into sauce on the side because diamond, I think had some of the, um, the best, examinations of this, right? She thought through it pretty in depth. Absolutely. And we, we have another listener who's been thinking about this as well. This is, in fact, listener mail, and I haven't mentioned uh, one of our beloved listeners. But uh, we got a note from uh, the Mitch Doctor, which is fun. Um, just a quick theory. Uh, hey, guys, here's a theory on Kate Middleton. I can't take credit for sparking this idea, but it seems to fit. Maybe she's an organ donor for King Charles, who is also in the hospital. A kidney donation? Seems more likely than some of the stuff currently on the internet. Ta-ta for now, the Mitch Doctor. Uh, I can only hope and assume that if they're saying ta-ta for now, that they are, in fact, British uh, citizens or maybe even royalty. Who knows? But thank you, the Mitch Doctor. I think that's very interesting. And um, uh, in, in, in preparing for this segment, I did find a really cool article from uh, The Intelligencer, which is, uh, I believe, a, a offshoot of New York Magazine. With It just came out yesterday as we record this on March 22nd with a timeline up to now of all of the Kate Middleton brouhaha. And, Ben, you mentioned the Brazilian butt lift thing. Um, I think, and, and we've, we've heard people say that maybe it was a gastric bypass uh, procedure and all of that simply from a statement from Kensington Palace announcing that Her Royal Highness, the Princess of Wales, was admitted to hospital yesterday for planned abdominal surgery. OK, and that came out. On January 17th of 2024, uh, and since that time, um, there, there hasn't – that's kind of, you know, when the speculation started to thrive because she hadn't really made any public appearances uh, reasonably close to that date and then up until now, except for the weird photoshopped image, which we talked about, and a video um, that came out. Uh, TMZ published uh, – well, it was, it was a photo, I believe – uh, TMZ published a paparazzi photo on March the 4th of Kate in a car with her mother near Windsor Castle. Um, and then there was also an individual uh, that's – yeah, sorry, here it is. Uh, the Sun uh, reported that Kate had been spotted shopping with William at Windsor Farm Shop. Um, and I believe a video was taken. And there's even an article uh, where the person who took the video is quoted and kind of deb trying their best to debunk these theories. But um, they're <sighs> – People have been trying to run this video through like AI algorithms to do facial matching stuff. Because I do have to say, on an initial glance, she looks a little different. I, I could see where people are coming from and looking at this image and this video and saying, huh, that doesn't quite look like my Kate. Um, and so there are people that are speculating that that is not her, that she's been replaced. Um, but then, like I said, the person, uh, the shopper who filmed uh, this video, or what, are they now going to question if I'm a real person as well? Did I put a fake Kate there? It is ridiculous. So um, I do kind of still stand by the fact that a lot of this stuff is just, you know, like armchair sleuths. And, and what was the word we used uh, uh, on the segment? I believe it was something like recreational speculators, something along those lines. But what do you think, guys, of the Mitch Doctor's theory? Um, well, first of all, I'm sorry, Ben. I want to point out, too, that uh, the Diamond, the producer, did say, I think this might be a big way of uh, shifting focus off of King Charles's illness. But um, what do you guys think about this idea that, that Kate is, is a donor? She's not exactly a direct family, so I don't see how that would... 
how she would be a uniquely suitable candidate. Honestly, the organ donation thing is interesting from a story construction kind of uh, perspective, but sure. in terms of real life, would it not be more plausible that they would get a donor who is the perfect match? Like, I think they would prioritize the safety of the donation process over the attachment of the family. Well, and wouldn't that be something to celebrate? You're saving the king's life or something, you know, by donating part of your body? I, I, I don't know. Yeah, and also there are a couple things at play. You don't want to have, well, you don't want to have any death, but um, for a monarchy to lose the monarch twice in quick succession, it's not a good look. So maybe this is distraction. Maybe this is, um, Diamond also pointed out the possibility that there was a serious illness on, on Middleton's side. That's right. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I'm with possible. you, Matt, though. On, on Yeah, an organ donation would be, that'd be a positive press story. Why would you hide that? If you were like, say, you know, that seems like something that you'd look the bravery of this woman. You know, you would want to promote that. The only way you would, the only reason I, I could imagine that you would want to hide something like that, which is a heroic thing to do, uh, is because it might be indicative of just how how far the king's condition has right. deteriorated. So maybe that's what they're trying to keep under wraps, if that theory is true. And, and and guys, I think I asked this last time we were talking about this, but what what is the true like to what end? What is the true benefit of of being so uh, you know sneaky around the health? of a public figure like that? Is it because it can affect deals and even markets and stuff? Is mm -hmm. it you just want to keep that stuff under your control and as long as humanly possible and don't want people to, to know what's really going on until the death actually occurs? That's part of it. I mean, there is state security wrapped up in this, right? So stability of the nation, the appearance of stability is uh, is a hugely important factor. So I, I imagine that's in the calculation somewhere. But but really, we don't have enough information to say what's happening definitively. And I'm sure that there are a ton of journalists in the United Kingdom who are doing their best, like social engineering, cold calling, trying to get information out of the monarchy and their staff. That may actually be the way that we learn what's happening. Yeah, it's interesting. I guess I just don't think, you know, it's not the same as a president being sick to me, you know, because they're just so toothless. The royal family, they, they're just ceremonial. They have this lavish lifestyle that's largely to maintain this continuity of sort of history and, and tradition, but they don't really do anything. So, like, what would what would be politically at stake? Is it just because the British people are so obsessed with them and there's such a reverence for them? Or I, I, maybe I just don't get it because I'm not, you know, yeah. from there. Um, yeah, I guess it's not for us. Not yeah, everything could be for everybody. But but yeah, the, you do raise a point. Um, the monarchy has tremendous real estate holdings. So that's that's a big deal. They're also a huge cultural and economic touchstone for the United Kingdom. Like the UK government makes a ton of money off royalty, off the concept of it. Think about right. all the people who travel around the world see London and to That's go right. check out that stuff. So, yeah. so they do play an economic role, a big one in that sense. I would. We were talking about that, I believe with somebody we were hanging out with in New York, um, just the tourism aspect of it is, is not something to be completely ignored. That's true. I don't know, Matt, you've been quiet on this one. Any thoughts? I know you, this isn't your bag exactly, but it's not mine either. I just, I, I mainly, uh, when we talked about it last time, my main interest was in just how, um, the brouhaha around the photo and just realizing the standards that like, you know, organizations like AP have and how it was just kind of missed. And just this whole distinction between like, is this photo entertainment or is this news and how is it taken and just how quickly these things can sort of, you know, balloon out of control. But uh, you got any closing thoughts for us on this one, Matt, before we uh, take a break? Uh, is it, are you still, 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 I don't care. <laughs> Oh, I, I thought you were, that was your Prince Charles. That's impression. good. Yeah. That's a good grumble, a very kingly grumble. <laughs> I yeah. I mean, I hope everybody's okay. Same. I do too. I do too. I hope they're happy. Yep. You think they're happy? They don't seem very happy on the crown. I mean, nobody's happy all the time. Fair enough. Well, uh, thanks to uh, the Mitch Doctor uh, for that theory. Uh, I, I certainly think that it could be plausible, but I don't see why that of all things they would cover up. 
We you guys just agree? need to know more. Yeah, I think so. I agree. Right. Mm -hmm. All right, let's take a quick break and we'll be back with some more messages from you. We've returned and we are going to the emails, guys, to get some updates on the last two weeks of strange news. We've got one coming in. Let's let's get started with an email from Brett, who wrote to us on March 11th with regards to a bit of a, a smuggling story. We talked about the first person that was ever charged with smuggling greenhouse gases into the United States from Mexico. And Brett uh, is coming to us with quite a bit of experience in the HVAC world. Let's see what he has to say. Brett says, I wanted to give you some insight on the latest strange news about the greenhouse gas smuggling. I'm an HVAC slash R, that's heat, ventilation, air conditioning, refrigeration technician in New York. You are right that you do need a license to purchase refrigerants, a license granted by the EPA. That's kind of cool. You have to take tests and pass to get one of those things. The Freon, known as R22, that's the substance that actually is a refrigerant, causes your refrigerator and your air conditioner to create cold air. you got to have this stuff run the air through it, makes it cold. This Freon, known as R22, has been used for decades, and in 2024, there's still equipment that uses it. Last summer, one 25-pound bottle of R22 cost $1,000. $750. That's a ton of money, guys. 25 pounds, 1700 bucks. That's with vendors limiting supply per EPA regulations. We'll talk about it, but remember, this R22 refrigerant Freon is a controlled substance at this point, a highly controlled substance, even though it's just a gas right it's free on mm -hmm. it's a it's a form of gas right this is pertaining to the black market sale of this stuff that we were talking yes. about or the availability of it on like was it facebook marketplace right yes why it's so tightly controlled why this person got in trouble for bringing something like this a got free it. on a refrigerant greenhouse gas into the u.s to sell uh so brett continues Lots of older techs hate using the replacement of this Freon, um, the replacement of R22, because it's not as good and sometimes causes more issues from size of equipment to how much cooling it will produce. So like how large the equipment is that uses the R22, right? I think that's what he's saying. Um, most times, having to buy newer equipment to replace the old system, whether it's still in working condition, some systems are only two to five pounds so they only require two to five pounds of this stuff for homes, but mark up for labor and use of it. I think what he's saying here, like with the huge cost of that greenhouse gas, you're only going to be using two to five pounds. Is that, do you think that's what Brett's saying here, guys? I think that's, I think what, so. that's kind I think of what I got. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, so Brett says it's cheaper to buy a brand new AC because most older techs and retired techs still have tanks of this good R22 greenhouse gas refrigerant they could use. Um, and again, for this alone, I'm used to this being the norm as it's the way of the job, but it does get hard telling those older generations who are retired with a fixed income that it's going to cost somewhere between $3,000 to $5,000, if not a ton more, guys, to replace their old HVA systems that used the R22. And Brett signs off saying thanks uh, for the show. So, guys, it, it just makes a lot of sense, especially hearing from somebody like this, that this type of greenhouse gas that's used as a refrigerant, it's potentially dangerous, right? According to the regulators who have chosen to, to put regulations on this stuff. But also, it's crazy, crazy expensive. I had no idea how expensive it was. But I call very vividly at my old house having to get more Freon pumped into my really old air conditioning system. And it was, I think it was $350 for a time, basically a shot of mm -hmm. this stuff to refill my system. Mm -hmm. Isn't that stuff that people actually steal out of air conditioning because it is so valuable? Maybe. I have no idea how you would do that. I've never looked into it. But well, I, I also think it's also something that people like, certain people like to huff. Oh. Um, I have heard tales of, of people going to apartment complexes and, and like uh, stealing Freon out of uh, those uh, air conditioning window units. It's all a price point thing, right? Like as soon be. as the... 
the price or potential for profit reaches a certain threshold, uh, then, you know, anything can be stolen. Shout out to catalytic converters converters and copper. Yeah. Yeah. And there's also, it's interesting because uh, first, thank you so much for the the letter here, Brett. Uh, It's interesting because when I was looking into the context of this, the refrigerant smuggling I didn't know it's been a thing since the 1990s and it happened because of the regulations that came about to close that hole in the ozone layer. Remember when that was a big deal for everybody? Yeah. So by fixing this one problem, which is a big problem, mm-hmm. society it's like created the cobra another. thing. <laughs> the cobra wow. effect, right? Ugh. Yeah, the cobra effect. You can go to a couple of places online. The one I found that immediately popped up just when you Google R22 which is called hydrochlorofluorocarbon-22, or HCFC-22. Um, the replacements are weird. They have all kinds of names like R410A, R134A, R407C, and R407A. They're just refrigerants, but they don't have, at least according to the EPA, the same ozone-depleting effects which is why they're being used. But again, as Brett is saying, they maybe don't cool as effectively and uh, Mm. they are going to cost you an arm and a leg. Mm. I don't have much else to say on that guys. Just appreciate Brett calling in with personal experience like that. Yeah. Thank you, Brett. Then let's jump to another message we received from always something in Philadelphia. Love that. Love that. And always something is responding to the strange news where we talked about uh, some people in Atlanta who are being targeted and attacked in Mm. local bars here in a place called Buckhead. Drugged and abducted, yeah. Yes, exactly. And tens of thousands of dollars coming out of their bank accounts. So always something says, Hi there, gents. I've been a sporadic listener for nearly 10 years. We need to up your listening. Always something uh, needs to be a little more than sporadic. (laughs) Just kidding. Thank you for listening at all. Um, And uh, always something has been a sporadic listener recently since I've had a job where I can have headphones on. That's awesome. Uh, And I've been listening a lot more regularly. Oh, fantastic. See, you already are. Yesterday, I heard you just talk about the guys who had tens of thousands of dollars stolen after being drugged at bars in Atlanta. I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up the story of heartthrob Philadelphia's weatherman, John Belaris or Belaris. I think it's Belaris. I loved reading this. And by the way, you're an awesome writer. So John Belaris, whose career was basically ruined because of a similar situation about 15 years ago. Interesting. John was a beloved weatherman and an A-list local celebrity in Philly with a bit of a wild streak. Known for things like being friends with controversial baseball player Lenny Dykstra or Dykstra, I guess. Uh, I don't know this person, but according to the Internet, uh, not great things. Not great things things yeah sexual assault accusations um in 2010 there was this allegation that uh he paid a uh an escort an adult entertainment actor with a bad check that bounced uh he would go on to be arrested on multiple misdemeanor and felony counts of things like identity theft possession of cocaine and ecstasy grand theft auto the crime not the video game got you Oy, oy, oy. Don't pay for unscrupulous things with bad checks. Gosh, come on, Lenny. Uh, okay, so John was partying in Miami and met some beautiful Eastern European women, at least according to the story, then blacked out and woke up to have tens of thousands of dollars missing from his accounts. He went public and he got help from the FBI, but he ended up losing his job and basically got blackballed because of the incident. If I remember correctly, this is always something saying that. There was some victim blaming about him tempted by the chance of a threesome and speculation that he was trying to be an actual, quote, John, uh, not just named John, and was ripped off by the ladies he was soliciting, which resulted in his being fired. He then made national headlines after being interviewed about it on 2020, uh, also in Playboy and by Howard Stern. And now apparently he's a realtor in Philly and still has local notoriety. Guys, I had never heard Nor of I. this person before at all. John Bolaris. Uh, just an, an interesting piece of information that none of us had before. This always something. So thank you. Um, but guess what? Here's where things get crazy. 
You did not mention devil's breath, the substance it's believed that John was drugged with. It comes from a South American species of Datura, D-A-T-U-R-A, which is a genus of night-blooming plants known for their mystical and intense psychotropic properties, used in various indigenous cultures, medicines, and rituals, as well as in witchcraft. Bro, is this what the guy in the car was being fed? He didn't know what it was? He had a hard time describing it? It wasn't a pill? Remember we that? Don't know what, we don't know what the substance was. Um, there's a great Vice documentary about uh, about this. The substance always something is describing here. And from that documentary, I, what I we were talking about this briefly off air. Uh, from what I remember about that, the method of application was to blow it as a dust or an aerosol mm. into the person's face. Uh, but that may that just may be one possible method of deployment. Yeah. Um, I'm assuming it's also consumed in one way or another in some of the other rituals, right? When it's more ritualized. So who knows exactly? I don't know exactly how it works. I remember a 2007 piece from Vice. And then I think it was around the time we started our YouTube channel that Vice put that uh, documentary out, uh, probably 2014, something like that. We've known about that for quite a while. We just, it didn't quite feel like this drug to us, but it's interesting, always something to bring it up and as a possibility, right? Uh, because there is a dissociative effect with that drug where uh, people seem to be, let's say, pliable in their actions, almost yes. like they're not really there. They'll go along with things. They're just agreeing to everything that if someone was in the position of like a captor, they might just agree with. Stuff like, hey, let's go to the this bank account. Oh, okay. I guess that's what we're doing. Very weird. At least that's the case of Devil's Breath and how it's been described. At least by Vice, that's really the only thing I've seen on it. Let's go back to the email here. In the U.S., the most well-known is Jimson Weed, which is associated with stories of 17th century colonists ingesting it and going crazy. I don't know anything about Jimson Weed. J-I-M-S-O-N. That's another interesting thing to look up. It's feeling like there's another uh, episode where we can talk about drugs that potentially could be used on you, right? As in maybe some kind of active attack. That could be sure. an interesting episode. Yeah. All right. So it continues on here. Devil's Breath is known for its ability to make people who ingest it very pliable. Oh, there's the word. That's why I had yeah. pliable <laughs> in my brain because I just read this from uh, Always Something. Sorry for taking your word there. Uh, it makes people very pliable and trusting while seeming coherent, then leaves victims forgetting the whole incident. So it's been known to be used in such con artist schemes. After the national headlines on the Belarus case, Vice made a video called World's Scariest Drug. That's when we were just talking about, Ben. And this is where they sent a crew to Colombia to investigate and try the substance out. So enjoy this weird Datura rabbit hole. Sincerely, always something in Philadelphia. Well, there you go. Uh, there's some stuff to check out on your own right now. Uh, World's Scariest Drug on Vice. Uh, learn about this <laughs> this interesting fellow here, John Bolaris, B-O-L-A-R-I-S. And uh, yeah, just go down the rabbit holes yourselves. We'll see what we find. And then let's come back together. Why don't you write to us or send us a message and let us know what you discover. We'll be right back with more messages from you. And we have returned. Uh, we are traveling down south uh, to visit our fellow conspiracy realist in Australia. And this is an ongoing conversation. A big thank you to Anonymous in Oz. Uh, we'll read the story. Uh, we'll stop along the way for a couple of different things. And we want to be careful with some details going in uh, to do what we can to protect uh, our listeners' anonymity. Um, also, unrelated, uh, unrelated. Uh, thanks to AA for writing in, uh, talking about the GHB, which should be in our episode on those drugs as weapons. All right, here we go. Hey guys, I'm writing to you from sunny and steamy far north Queensland in Australia. Your recent strange news story regarding those poor actors hired for the fake Wonka event prompted me to share my story with you. On 23rd June of 2011, I was hired as an extra, aspiring actress and all that, through my talent agency and told to attend a large hotel in, the, uh, in Sydney, Australia. There were 200 extras 
all hired from our agency. The only information we were given was to wear smart business attire. And here they mean smart, like, you know, fancy, like your C-suite at an office or something. On arrival, a lady checked off our names and handed me a large envelope. Walking into the conference room, it became clear we were in an AGM, an annual general meeting of a very large corporation. I opened my envelope. There was a share certificate. It's like a certificate giving you a certain number of shares. Uh, So a share certificate with my name and address on it, a ballot form for this big vote that had already been filled out. I was told to go to another person, show them my ID, my share certificate, and then put my ballot into a box. Uh, I can't remember the full name of the organization, uh, Anonymous says originally, but it was definitely a life insurance or superannuation company. There were a lot of very distressed older people at the meeting. And this already sounds fishy, right? Being a paid actor in a Willy Wonka experience is one thing, but being paid to rig a corporation's votes, is that what, that's what this sounds like, right? (laughs) Jeez. Like we talk about things like crisis actors sometimes and the word actor being thrown in there always made me think of if this is even a thing, where does one go to purchase the services of a crisis actor? Is it a special service offered by talent agencies? Like this seems like an unusual situation. Mm -hmm. It also reminds me of when lobbyists have rigged different local votes by packing, packing crowds. But Anonymous continues and says, you can tell this was kind of weird for her, too. She says, I asked why a share certificate had been made up in my name, and I was told it was done through my talent agency, and I was free to leave once I had cast my vote. I was told I'd be paid for the full four hour call time, but you just had to show your ID and drop the ballot in the box. Then I was told if I handed them back my share certificate, I get an additional $200 in cash. So they're like, also, you have to sell the shares back to us. What? Yeah, they want to keep it clean. (laughs) Right. Well, so there's no um, record of the payment then? Or no, because she's getting paid as an actor Mm -hmm. and getting $200 in cash, but the shares go... If she if she sell sells the shares back, I guess technically, and it makes me wonder if that's the case for all these other extras. Then, if you look at the company's record, it seems like there were all of a sudden a ton of people who got shares, voted once, and then got out. That's wow. very unusual. This is, of course, fraud. I think, yeah, you know, I'm not like the king of fraud, but I think it is. Like, I I'm <laughs> I'm not a fraud expert, but it does. It's surprising to me that that is not illegal. It's right? like insider trading almost kind of, right? Where there's maybe a gray area for when does that I become guess. a crime and what is just kind of like acting on information and, and happenstance. I, I don't know. It's just, we it's love a weird weirdly way. specific crimes, you know, shout out to stamp True fraud. That. But yeah. this is this one is so specific and uh strange that I think we couldn't figure out initially if it is illegal. So. Anonymous continues, I knew this was totally immoral, if not illegal, so I did not cast my vote. I contacted my agency to complain, and they were not interested at all. Their cut from the 200 extras that day mattered more than what we had actually been sent to do. Uh, Checks out? <laughs> yeah, right? I guess it does, but I've, it's weird that, you know, that a talent agency would allow themselves to be mixed up in something like this, but I you guess if it diversify. pays. Yeah, got to diversify, you know? It's I'll a still gig. Think of, Yeah, it's a gig. A gig is a gig, right? Um, Especially if you're aspiring in the entertainment industry. And and do you see what I mean about the crisis actors thing, too? Doesn't it feel aligned in a way? It feels similar to the crisis actor theory, for sure. The idea that you are hiring someone on a short-term basis to appear as though they are someone else. Uh, And crisis actors, it's a very controversial conspiracy theory. It hasn't been proven. Um, But that's... That's wrapped up. It's part and parcel of the Alex Alex Jones Jones allegations about uh, Sandy Hook. Anyway, so Anonymous says, I know it made the media at the time. I'm having a hard time finding anything about it now. Pretty shady way of swinging the outcome of uh, AGM, huh? Or as we Aussies say, dodgy. Anonymous, we say dodgy too. That's true. (laughs) Don't we all say dodgy? Anyway, uh, so thank you for the show. It means a lot. Uh, And then... I wrote back to Anonymous uh, and 
wanted to get more information, and Anonymous revealed the name. The name of the company is Premium Income Fund. Uh, it is like, you know, the mentioned super superannuation. That's kind of like a that's like a pension retirement plan thing. And premium income fund uh, is apparently tied up to retirement savings for a lot of older people in the in that country. Uh, so it's and, like a shareholder meeting of some sort? Like yeah, is that the thing like where the people who are voting are supposed to be a part? Like you have to be a member or something? Yeah, it's very strange. We don't have all the details yet, but that's what it sounds like. And it also sounds like someone, whomever contacted the talent agency, wanted the vote to go a certain way. And if those other people that Anonymous saw, who were actual shareholders, if they were very distressed, then it sounds like it's a controversial vote, you know? Yeah. That has to be illegal. Do we have any Australian lawyers or barristers in the crowd? If so, conspiracydieheartradio.com. You know, uh, one eight three three S T D W Y T K. Uh, we would love to know more about this. So there was a huge civil action afterwards. Ten thousand retirees per anonymous, because we talked back and forth about this, uh, were, in her words, screwed out of their life savings. Uh, and anonymous just uh, again needs to stay anonymous. But this brought up so many questions for me and i think for all of us how often does stuff like this happen does it ha- could it happen in the us could you bring a shareholder vote it makes me think of succession of course <laughs> i mean if it could yes it could happen and likely has happened especially considering how uh relatively straightforward a process this was you know mm-hmm. um i don't know that's wild I, I, psh- that's the surprising thing, you know, uh, that it's the straightforwardness of it. And also it's terrible that it sounds like it's being predatory against these retirees. And uh, on a personal level, I think we can all find that repugnant. Uh, but I would love to hear more about this. Have you guys ever heard of something like this happening before? Like I hear it and it makes sense, but I've never thought someone, I've never thought of someone doing that. It seems like if you're voting you know, in a shareholder meeting or something like that, I'm sure we've all been shareholders at some point in our careers just through like discovery. We used to, they used to send out some weird stuff with that one back when we like got discovery stock, oh, yeah. I guess. We're, we're like, what is vesting? Yeah. Spoiler, we, it's not a real vest. Well, we're, we're pretty young folks back then. I didn't know anything about any of this stuff. And we would get in the mail like a ballot basically that you would vote on stuff that's up for as a shareholder, basically. And I do wonder if this thing, this premium income fund, that's what it's called. Premium income premium fund income fund. And what do we say about innocuous names? Well, like I'm looking through trying to find exactly what it is. And if there was a vote that you could check, like a um, um, meeting that had minutes or a results of something. Mm-hmm. And I'm having a really hard time just in the moment. But Same. We got a PDF uh, that does have more information. But again, in the interest of anonymity, we don't want to share too much of that on air. Uh, but we also, you know, now that I'm thinking through it, maybe it's just immoral. Maybe it's not technically illegal because they do own the shares when they vote. Yeah. But someone filled out their ballot already for them. I don't know. All right. Well, we are going to follow up with this in the future. We want to learn more about it. We want to hear from you folks if you have encountered similar strange shenanigans. Uh, And before we end, we wanted to do uh, another uh, segment that we've been calling Letters from Home. Uh, We got a pretty thought provoking message over on ye old internets. So Doug M writes to us uh, via Instagram or hit me up on Instagram and said, listening to the strange news on Franken sheep being used for hunting. The future seems to be cloning humans for use in government training, police, super weather fun time. But what would be the legal standing for murdering a clone? That's going to keep me busy today. 
clone rights, and then also great episode. And as soon as I read this, I thought I would love we would love this discussion on air. Uh, clone rights. Do you guys think clones will be on the way? Like manufactured cannon fodder for war? That's gross. <laughs> I mean, yeah, of course, if they can do it, they probably will try. But, I mean, we were talking about this off mic briefly, and I just think there have to be. That, that conversation has to happen. They're, you know, I mean, for all intents and purposes, a clone is, it's it's a person. It's not a robot. It's not an AI. It's flesh and blood and presumably something <laughs> resembling a soul. I don't think they'll be used for cannon fodder in war. I think the robots, the machines are going to be that. A little, little more efficient, yeah. I think it's going to be that organ harvesting, all that other stuff with uh, if clones become a thing, mm-hmm. it's a personal clone and it's just got your stuff in it. Okay. And you think we can just use them? We can just harvest their organs and have them as like blood boys, you know? Is that well, really? Where, where's the line? Do you just, do you grow, do you grow individual organs in some kind of suspension? Do you grow a full body, but without a brain just or a head? Just spare, you know? Yeah. And that that does get pretty gory pretty quickly. Um, I, I wonder if, like right now, one of the main stumbling blocks in the in the science behind human cloning is that there are some hard ethical constraints about what you can and can't clone, how long you can allow uh, a human clone to exist. Uh, it's I feel like clones will be on the way though because the science is possible. I just don't know what they'll be used for. Have either of you guys seen uh, Poor Things, the film? I cannot wait to watch it, but I've not seen it yet. It's really, really great, first of all. And it's not nearly as, like, uh, raunchy and controversial as people seem to be making it out. I mean, it's got some, you know, titillating Mm -hmm. stuff, but it really is, to me, a very nice movie. It has a kindness to it in a way. But it's, of course, the classic Frankenstein story where you create a thing and then realize that it also learns and has feelings and changes, and you can't just treat it like a like a pet or, or, or even worse, like a, like a slave or like something without agency. Uh, and this movie kind of takes a, a feminist uh, approach to that concept. And I think it does it beautifully, but that's the thing, man. Like I, Ben, you mentioned without a brain. Oh, even just the, the, the saying that just sounds wrong. Doesn't it? Like, wow. Yeah. Like remove the cortex, the yeah. cerebellum and so on. It's like, it, it's like uh, uh, giving somebody a lobotomy in a, in a, mm-hmm. in a uh, sanitarium. To, to a pre-lobotomy. A pre-lobotomy. Yeah. It's, and it's also, it reminds me, there was a recent episode or an episode from a recent season of Rick and Morty, which is all about the tasty spaghetti sauce. Did yeah. you guys see that one? <laughs> no, I don't know that one. Okay. Well, light spoilers ahead, folks, or big spoilers ahead. Uh, three, two, one, spoilers So in this one episode of Rick and Morty, the family is having uh, their weekly like family dinner time and everybody loves Grandpa Rick's spaghetti. It's uh, like a secret family recipe that he talks about. They're nuts for it. It's called uh, That's a Morte. And what they learn is that this spaghetti comes from uh, the death of aliens, like aliens on this other planet when they die. Their guts are the spaghetti. Oh, wow. And the sauce. Yeah. Also, guys, light spoilers, Soylent Green, it, it, it's people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's Gary Oldman the whole time. We, we got a review on, on uh, Apple Podcasts that says, these guys are constantly spoiling stuff I haven't finished yet. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, then, <laughs> shall we proceed? Yes, indeed. So the, um, the reason I bring this up, and all sorts of hijinks happens. Rick and Morty has these fantastic writers, these incredible concepts. And uh, in there, they try uh, the people who are the origin point of the spaghetti, their civilization – institutes an economy of scale and they say hey how can we ethically reconcile the fact that the best spaghetti in the universe has to come from these people dying and then they manufacture like clone things and grandpa rick says all right let's just make torsos get rid of the human or the thinking the consciousness problem altogether and they say okay we make torsos i forgot the big thing in this episode they only turn into amazing spaghetti if they kill themselves, if they commit oh, suicide. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Right. And so they end up. That's building, what makes it taste the best. I guess so. And otherwise they just die like a regular life form. 
So they get to a point where they build out just torsos, but because the torsos have to commit suicide, they give them one arm and there's, and they just, the torsos use that one arm to become spaghetti. Cool. Good God. Is uh, that where cloning is going? We need yes. to check with Dan Harmon on this. Like what, a, what what's going on there, man? Yeah. Uh, I think it's fascinating, but I also think it's, I think cloning is on the way. It is inevitable and civilization is not prepared. I guess I always just think this is probably also a thing I've seen in Rick and Morty, but I've certainly seen in other cartoons, maybe Family Guy, where you've got like the clone gone wrong and it's just oh, like, yeah. kill yeah. me, you know, mm-hmm. like, mm-hmm. Ugh, it's it's ghastly stuff uh, if 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 not treated with the utmost of respect and um, and morality, which I don't know how you even do that properly. I think I like the idea of growing the organs individually in a lab, mm-hmm. but maybe didn't they have a thing where they could grow like the ear on the back of a mouse or something yeah, 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 like, yeah. that's interesting i mean you know i'm sure there's people out there that are like no don't kill the poor mouse um but there's got to be ways of doing that the the really you know life-changing parts of this without having to sacrifice our humanity and become some sort of like mad gods mm. and you know what i what i like about this episode is it, it, it packs in so many things right like the the ethics of factory livestock and eating Mm. meat you know the problem of cloning the problem of the nature of existence uh it's yeah it's a wild ride and i hope it stays science fiction for a while but like with all good science fiction how long is it before some part of that becomes science fact and um i don't know if you guys had a chance to clone yourselves would you do it i don't think so i mean if, if it was like you know I would think of this in terms of like save the life of my child kind of stuff. You know what I mean? I see. Yeah. So it'd have to be very high stakes. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. But it's also the kind of technology that's, of course, going to only be available to the mega, mega privileged and mega, mega rich. Maybe, yeah. In mm-hmm. the beginning. There's also this other idea. Um, I think this is weirdly plausible. Hear me out, guys. Uh, you're a business tycoon, right? You're a Warren Buffett level. Uh, financier or you know you're just a very powerful business person and you are going to die you have a terminal condition you know it it's inevitable you can't save your own life however you can continue your estate and your companies and your corporations if you clone yourself and sign over the legal rights to your clone so then just version one of you dies And then the other guy just sails right along, creating a potentially never-ending cycle of power, lineage. Dudes, have you guys seen Infinity Pool, the Brandon Cronenberg film? I think I have. No, no you'd remember much about it. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. Speaking to the one uh, dissenting voice on on Apple Podcasts, I'm not going to spoil it, but there is it's it's basically a a, a film where the super rich are able to buy a get out of jail free card for committing horrible crimes. Oh, that's what I have seen. Okay. This. Okay. Yes. Yeah. yeah uh, I've seen by this. basically mm-hmm. through cloning, um, mm-hmm. they're able to create. Well, okay. Whatever. I'm, this is not a spoiler. There's a million things, other things that happen, and this is in the I trailer. Um, they they are able to create a clone that then is executed on their behalf, and because of this, like, there's a ritual aspect to it. They have to watch it happen, but uh, it it really does beg the question of like what would you, people do with if, if they never had to be held accountable for their actions? Mm-hmm. Um, and the clone part of it is like, yeah, it, it feels it. It knows what's, it doesn't know what's happening because it's memory. It only starts at the moment of its birth, but it's like you're, it's being horrifically executed on behalf of its clone master. Mm-hmm. And even star Wars hits on this, right? With the clone. Wars. Absolutely. People have been thinking about this for a long time. There is a, there is a fantastic, Orson Scott Card uh, short story, and I disagree fundamentally with Card in his personal life and his beliefs, but uh, the story itself is really good. That is all about the nature of attempting redemption physiologically, spiritually, financially through cloning. Spoiler, it's like an O. Henry story. It doesn't, it has a twist, of Got course. It. Uh, and this is this is strange because I think also other versions of cloning are coming to the fore before the before the rollout of human clones in the physical sense will have the rollout of cloned voices and appearances. 
is part of why I think it's inevitable because it's already happening in the world of entertainment. I think there are a couple big companies post actor strike who, uh, who will require extras and people getting started in Hollywood to sign away the rights to their appearance in the background of things like their body gets matched sure, and they get a flat fee once. And then your likeness can be used in any movie owned by that company. Great new Black Mirror episode in the most recent season that handles that whole concept uh, mm. brilliantly, as they usually do. Yeah. And so we want to hear your thoughts about this, folks. Uh, we want to hear the, what you think uh, the world should keep in mind if we do arrive at an age of cloning. Thank you to Doug M. Thank you to Anonymous and Oz. Thanks to Brock, always something in Philly. Delphia. Thanks to Brett. Thanks, of course, to the Mitch Doctor. And thank you to you, fellow conspiracy realists, for tuning in. If you would like to be part of the show, we would love to have you. We try to be easy to find online. That's right. You can find us at the handle Conspiracy Stuff, where we exist on uh, X, FKA Twitter, on um, Facebook, and on YouTube, where we have delightful video content rolling out every single week. On Instagram and TikTok, we are Conspiracy Stuff Show. Hey, call us. We are 1-833-STDWYTK. Go ahead and put that phone number in your system, in your phone as a contact, so you'll know if you get a call back, mysteriously so. When you call the number, make sure you give yourself a cool nickname and let us know if we can use your name and message on the air. And uh, really, that's it. There's no rules. Do whatever you want. But if you've got an attachment or a link you want to send us, why not instead shoot us a good old fashioned email? We are the folks who read every single email we get 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Take us to the edge of the rat hole. We will do the rest. And be aware, folks, sometimes the void writes back. Conspiracy at iHeartRadio.com. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.